Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question asks if I can analyze the mental health and personality factors that may be at work in the Ray Rivera case. This case was covered on the Netflix series, Unsolved Mysteries. Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I'll put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at what happened in this case, Rivera's background, what led to his death. Then I'll talk about the mental health and personality factors. So starting with the background, Ray Rivera was born on June 10, 1973. At the time of his death, he was working as a finance writer for a company in Baltimore, Maryland named Stansbury and Associates. Porter Stansbury was a friend of Ray Rivera who hired him for that job. They had gone to high school together in California. They both played water polo. Rivera and his wife, Allison, had moved from California to Baltimore so Rivera could take that position. This takes us to May 16, 2006, at about 5.30 p.m. Rivera was at his house in Baltimore, and he received a phone call that came from Agora Publishing. Stansbury & Associates is a subsidiary of that company. The exact origin of the call, like who made it, is not known. After this phone call, he left the house abruptly in his SUV. His family started looking for him, and a few days later, they found his vehicle in a parking lot not far from where he worked. They also found a hole in the roof of the south wing of the Belvedere Hotel. This is a historic hotel in Baltimore. The police searched that building and found Rivera's body. At first glance, this case seems fairly clear. Usually when a body is recovered near a tall building, with wounds fairly consistent with jumping, a conclusion is made that the person did, in fact, jump to their death. However, in the case of Rivera, the physics of jumping did not seem to line up. Rivera would have had to have been running fairly quickly when he jumped off the roof in order to travel the horizontal distance to line up with the hole in that building. He was wearing flip-flops, which are not usually known to facilitate running. Now, to get around the horizontal distance problem, he could have jumped from another floor, but to do this, he would have had to go through privately owned office and condominiums on a lower floor, and no one reported an unexpected entry in those units. The author of a book about Rivera said that she talked to people who produced the Netflix show for hours and told them the roof could be easily accessed. This isn't really revealed in that episode. The show made it appear as though getting to the roof was difficult. Rivera's cell phone and his eyeglasses were found near the hole and the roof. They did not have significant damage, making people wonder if those items actually traveled the entire distance that Rivera did, or were they simply placed next to his body after a homicide. Rivera also carried a money clip on a regular basis that was never located. Now, the Netflix series made kind of a big deal about this guy, Porter Stansberry. The episode claimed that his company prevented employees from talking to the police, or giving interviews to anyone about the case. Evidently, Stansberry did not talk to anyone who produced Unsolved Mysteries, but after the episode aired, we see that Porter Stansberry did talk to the Baltimore Sun. He said that he was shocked and hurt by the insinuations made in the show. He added that he never commented about Rivera's death because he never thought there was a mystery. Stansberry also claimed that he did meet with the police in June of 2006, which of course would not have been long after Rivera's body was discovered. His body was discovered on May 24, 2006. He said that after Rivera went missing, he hired a private investigator, offered a reward, and personally assisted in the search. He denies there were ever instructions issued to employees at the company ordering them not to talk to the police, only that they were instructed to refer media inquiries to the company spokesperson. Regarding the phone call from Agora Publishing, Stansbury said that Rivera was doing freelance work for that company, and nobody at Stansbury & Associates could have placed that call because they were at a retreat that day. According to Stansbury, he had a conversation with Rivera at one point where Rivera asked Stansbury if he was in the leadership of the Freemasons. Stansbury thought that was a joke. He also said that Allison, again Rivera's wife, made several statements to him about Rivera's mental health. Rivera was morose and would not get out of bed the Saturday before he went missing, and his wife also said she was very worried about his mental state. 
Allison said she could not recall such a conversation with Stansbury. She believed her husband was in good spirits, although he was anxious about work. One of Rivera's childhood friends, named Brad Hopman, said that not long before Rivera's death, Rivera repeatedly asked him about being a member of the Freemasons and talked about the movie Eyes Wide Shut. Hopman said that a few weeks preceding Rivera's death, Rivera asked him if he could visit a top floor of an apartment in Jersey City, New Jersey, that Hopman owned. Rivera took the keys to that apartment, but then returned them. Hopman described Rivera's behavior as really, really weird. This reminds me of a story about the term very, very strange. A while back when I was consulting to a mental health agency, we see that people were receiving services there and there was this waiting room. There was a report by one of the individuals waiting for services, a woman, about a suspicious man who had been with her in that waiting room. Later, that suspicious man caused some difficulties, so an incident report was completed by the agency. When taking the woman's statement, the clinician taking the statement read back to her the description of the man in which she stated that he was very, very strange. And the woman corrected the clinician and said, no, I said very strange. If he was very, very strange, I would have called the police that moment. Drawing this distinction between very strange and very, very strange. So it made me wonder if that same distinction exists between really weird and really, really weird. Anyway, back to the case. It's worth noting that Porter Stansbury did have some legal difficulties after this case was over. He was involved in selling fraudulent stock tips to investors. In 2007, a judge ruled that Stansbury's conduct undoubtedly involved deliberate fraud and making statements he knew to be false. He was fined one and a half million dollars. So this does kind of give us a new angle to look at in terms of his credibility. Porter Stansbury reports that he has received death threats and his family has been harassed online because of what was said in that Netflix show. This brings us to the note that Ray Rivera left that was discovered after his death. Evidently, Rivera regularly wrote down notes on pieces of paper and left them in various places. It may have been connected with his desire to be a screenwriter. Perhaps he was creative and wanted to capture some of his thoughts as he had them. Rivera had left a folded note next to his computer that in theory was written not long before his death. It was located at his residence and it has a number of unusual references in it that have led to speculation. Was this note a way for Rivera to communicate that he was intending to bring an end to his life? Did it have nothing to do with that? Apparently, the police asked the FBI to analyze the note, and the FBI said that it was not indicative of somebody who was thinking about suicide, but the contents were consistent with delusional disorder or bipolar disorder. So I read the note. Here are some features that stood out for me and my thoughts on it. The note starts out talking about what an awesome sight erupting volcanoes are, it mentions the word death early in the note in a quote, whom virtue unites, death will not separate. This quote is associated often with Freemasons. This group seems to come up repeatedly in this case. He talks about a well-played game and says it's time to wake up. It's like he's talking to an audience that understands what the game is or who put him into the game. He talks about finding the truth, accepting this quest for truth, he refers to the members of the council, perhaps another reference to the Freemasons, and appears to be talking about how they invited players into this game. He makes a reference to Porter Stansberry, actually several times in the note. At this point, he says something about a prize. Then he talks about how the game is finished. After this, he talks about a number of innovations, radio frequency identification, which could be a reference to the conspiracy theory about microchips being used to track citizens. He mentions genetic engineering, overnight express shipping, Wi-Fi, the internet, and a few other things that seem to be related to technology. He said that the rights, patents, and proceeds from those innovations should be transferred to him by now. He will resume control of his primary residence in northern Argentina. This could be another reference to Porter Stansberry. As I understand it, the founder of Agora Publishing has property in Argentina. That's not Porter Stansbury. It's a guy named Bill Bonner. But either way, there's a connection there to Porter. After this, Rivera talks about inspirational movies. 
I think his choice of movies really reveals a pattern, or potentially it does. Just to name a few of them, we see all three Matrix movies, Star Wars 1 to 3, and Lord of the Rings 1 to 3. We also see National Treasure, The Da Vinci Code, Eyes Wide Shut, Minority Report, Fight Club, The Game, Seven, The Sixth Sense, and Signs. The theme we see with these movies is that many of them are tied to conspiracies, like National Treasure, Minority Report, and The Matrix movies. The Matrix movies in particular are popular among conspiracy theorists, especially those who have more extreme views. There are references to the Freemasons in his note and in conversations he had. This group comes up a lot in connection with conspiracy theories. There are so many that they're involved with, but just to name a few, the Masons faked the moon landings. They are preventing people from realizing the earth is flat. They've infiltrated all levels of the government. They're the ones who created income tax. And of course, my favorite, some or all of the Freemasons are alien lizard people. Rivera believed that the Freemasons ran the East Coast film industry. He believed the West Coast was run by the Church of Scientology. Now, with Rivera's reference to the movie The Game, we see this connection with the skylights. In that movie, there were skylights as somebody jumped down, and of course, there were skylights next to the hole in the roof that Rivera went through. So the theory is that perhaps he believed he was in something like The Game. These Freemasons were in reality, they were in the real world, and they created this artificial environment that Rivera was in. So they were watching him, but also kind of rooting for him, giving him clues, like these different movies that reveal the truth of this fake environment. They reveal the nature of the Freemasons. So he was writing this note, perhaps, to demonstrate to those Freemasons that he had seen all the clues and he understood them, and he was ready for his reward. He was ready to be granted these innovations, to be granted property, to ascend to the level of the Freemasons. So in his mind, it was time to move from this artificial reality, this distortion, to actual reality. Right? That may have been what he was thinking. That seems to be what's going on based on what we see in the note. Sometimes this is referred to as a Truman Show delusion. This is a reference to a movie starring Jim Carrey, where he's a character that is in this artificial environment, and he starts to pick up on clues. So I think this is a reasonable theory. It does seem like, based on the note and the other things we see happening with Rivera, his conversations and his behavior, that he could have been thinking of himself as trapped in a game. So he was in a false reality. In addition to the unusual content, the writing of this note is highly disorganized. It's not writing that somebody could make a living with or really use in any way for work. It doesn't really seem to have any purpose other than perhaps the one I talked about that may be delusional. It didn't have many clear or complete sentences or thoughts. It also made references as if the reader understood what the writer was talking about. So it presumed knowledge on the part of the reader, again consistent with this idea that the Freemasons were looking down on Rivera and he was writing this to communicate with them. He didn't need to put in a lot of backstory because they know everything. Stepping back and looking at this letter in its entirety, it does seem to be consistent with bizarre or even delusional thinking. So what could be going on here? If Rivera was having paranoid and persecutory delusions, then there are a number of possibilities like schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, delusional disorder, major depressive disorder, bipolar disorder. If it was paranoid thinking that did not rise to the level of delusional, then it could be something like cluster A personality pathology, perhaps paranoid or schizotypal personality disorder. Of course, there's no way to know for certain, but schizophrenia seems likely, or something like schizophrenia, like schizoaffective. It could also be something like bipolar disorder. That could explain a lot. Maybe a mixed episode. So we see both manic and depressive symptoms. Both theories really do explain a lot. We see a number of recent stressors that could have exacerbated a psychotic illness. Burglar alarms went off at Rivera's residence two nights in a row, May 15 and May 16. And of course, May 16 is the day he went missing. A friend of his who worked for Agora died a few months before Rivera died, 
Rivera evidently looked at his death as suspicious, so he could have thought that maybe his friend had realized what was going on with the Freemasons and tried to escape this false reality and go be with the Freemasons. He could have looked at his friend's death as a signal that it was time for him to discover what he was supposed to do. It was time for him to move on. He also became increasingly aware of Stansberry's legal problems. If it was a disorder like schizophrenia, schizoaffective, bipolar disorder, he could have had what's referred to as a first break psychosis. So here I'm really talking about psychotic illnesses in general. All psychotic illnesses would have a point where the symptoms were first evident. Many people who develop psychosis go through this period of time where their behavior is bizarre and they have odd thinking or speech, perhaps they're paranoid, but the symptoms aren't always extreme. Like there may be moments of paranoia, but then the individual seems okay. So in a way, when people develop psychotic illnesses, they kind of look like they have cluster A personality pathology, but then there comes a point where they have this first break psychosis, the first episode of true hallucinations and or delusions. And it's usually fairly distinct. People around the individual recognize that the symptoms are severe, even if they didn't recognize the cluster A personality features. What makes the onset of a disorder involving psychosis so challenging is that the cluster A personality features don't always indicate that somebody is going to develop a more severe disorder. Statistically, the majority of the time, if somebody has cluster A personality features or pathology, they're not going to develop something like schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. I've spoken to many people with cluster A symptoms, and when I would talk to them again, say, months later or even years later, most of them were the same. Some had improved, but some did go on to have a first break psychotic episode, and they were diagnosed with something like schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, or bipolar disorder. The onset of many of these disorders typically would be in the early 20s to the late 20s. Rivera was 32. This is a little bit later than I would expect, but really not that unusual. I've seen people in their 40s and 50s that had first break psychosis. The psychotic illness theory really does explain a lot. It explains him causing his own death. This unfortunately is a substantial risk with these disorders. It explains how people around him didn't quite know what was going on. Again, he may have gone from bizarre to psychotic quite quickly. Also, his paranoia would explain why people didn't necessarily think something was seriously wrong. He was trying to be careful to disguise his symptoms because he was afraid. For many people who have paranoid delusions, much of the time, family and friends, as well as mental health professionals, keep an eye on the individual. They realize the individual has had these delusions. They kind of know what's going on with that. But with first break psychosis, no structures are in place to help the person with the symptoms. So it's just out of nowhere. It's unexpected, at least from the point of view of an observer. This theory could also explain the severity of the symptoms and the severity of his behavior. It could account for the mood disturbance piece as well, like the anxiety and the depression. So stepping back and looking at everything, what happened to Ray Rivera? Looking at the probabilities for various explanations, I think it's reasonable to believe that he jumped to his death. There was no one else involved in his death. He could have been motivated by psychosis, feelings of depression, mania, or all of those. There were some unusual features in this case that do seem to point to foul play, but nothing that can overwhelm the mental health explanation. I think this case really highlights the danger of delusions and how those delusions can tie in with conspiratorial thinking. Belief in conspiracy theories can seem innocent at first, but it can be a serious problem. It's worth noting that many people who believe in conspiracy theories would not necessarily be classified as delusional. Which brings up the question, why would anybody who is not delusional believe in conspiracy theories? These beliefs are frightening and anxiety provoking. Who would choose to think this way? Well, as I mentioned, sometimes it's not a choice. It's a delusion. But when it is a choice, there's actually an explanation that may be kind of wrapped up in this Rivera case. This case may answer this question in an unexpected way. Many people believe that Rivera was killed by others. Some people came to this conclusion by looking at the evidence and weighing it, but others may at some level know that others were not involved. It's hard to accept the idea that he caused 
his own death. The irony here is that believing that there may have been some type of conspiracy may make people feel better about what actually happened. For many people, it may be better to believe that others killed Rivera than to believe that he did not want to live or that he wanted to exit this reality. People who need to believe that he was murdered aren't necessarily delusional. Rather, they just may be trying to avoid the pain of reality. This is how conspiracy theories function and how they affect people at all different levels, even if somebody doesn't believe in alien lizard humanoids and the fake moon landings. Those conspiracy theories are major, but there are many little conspiracy theories that people believe on an everyday basis. Sometimes this is referred to as denial. But here's the thing with this. Dying because of a mental illness, like a disorder associated with psychosis, does not mean that the person wanted to die. It doesn't mean they hated anyone. It doesn't mean they failed to love anyone. It just means that the symptoms were pronounced. It was not a decision in the way that somebody unaffected by psychosis would make a decision. For those that have a first break psychosis, it represents an extremely dangerous time in their lives. No one around the person knows what's wrong. No one knows to get help or even how to find assistance if they did think that something was wrong. And the person with the symptoms is overwhelmed by all these delusions, hallucinations, and paranoia for the first time. It's frightening and tragic, but it's no one's fault. Those are my thoughts on the Ray Rivera case. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comments section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be interesting. Thanks for watching.